Welcome back to Those Happy Places, the podcast that treats theme parks, rides, and attractions like literature. I'm Buddy Duquesne. And I'm Alice White. And Alice, guess what? What? Uh, Today, we've got a really fascinating episode about three very special words that relate to theme parks and themed spaces. Um, And we've got a really special treat where we have a... um, like a special call-in voicemail guest that we're going to be cutting to intermittently, right? That's right. Our very dear friend and listener, Lena Jean, sent us a voicemail after she went to Disneyland Paris and gave us um, several minutes worth of awesome thoughts uh, about about the differences and uh, certain observations that she had about uh, Disneyland Paris versus her uh, home turf of uh, of D- Walt Disney World, and so and and really uh, touched on a couple of points that we already wanted to address in this episode. So, uh, in a couple of points throughout this episode, we will cut over to to Lena Jean, who will sum up um, an idea uh, regarding Disneyland Paris, and then we will. Uh, expand upon that idea and and it'll be great yeah uh, Lena Jean thank you so much for uh, sending us this voicemail you are uh, you are awesome and we're really lucky to have you as a as a listener yeah and uh, before we get started with the rest of the episode we should probably take a moment to thank our Patreon backers uh, who are at the read your name at the top of the episode tier Yes, uh, T.H. Ponders and Charles Gustine, uh, two uh, excellent listeners and really uh, who have very good podcasts of their own. Both of them are at the $7 or above level on Patreon, uh, which means, well, we get to read their name at the top of the show and thank them personally. Uh, And if that sounds like something that you'd be interested in, head on over to our Patreon, patreon.com slash those happy places and see which Patreon level is right for you. Yeah, that's right. So, Alice, uh, let's dive right into the content of this episode. Um, And I don't want to beat around the bush anymore. I've got these three words, and I really want our our audience to start chewing on them a little bit. Okay, what are those three words? So, word number one, adventure. Uh, Word number two, exploration. And word number three is magic. Uh, And these are three really big theme park words. Uh, yes, they're they're enormously popular when people uh, describe their experiences at theme parks, when theme parks talk about the experiences that they offer. Uh, and it's so interesting to me, these three words in particular, because they well, they're they're not exactly accurate to a theme park experience, um, not in like a literal sense. No, they uh, definitely seem to be used as uh, as metaphors or feelings, really, that a theme park is trying to generate in a uh, in a visitor, rather than something that they literally offer. Um, and I think a really good example of that to start from from um, with your first example word uh, is the word adventure. Yeah, I mean, like adventure is. Uh... It's a it's a very clearly defined word. It has it has its own, you know, intrinsic meaning that we kind of understand as soon as we hear it. Adventure has to do with striking out to places unknown, Uh, probably unknown to you uh, is, is a pretty good way to say it. It doesn't really need to be unknown by anybody, but it needs to be like an exciting, uh, maybe a little dangerous sort of a journey. Um, it has to have, you know, just just a, a small amount of peril uh, or at least some challenge along the way. Uh, and generally, it's not something that is um, it's not something that's experienced by everyone. Right. Uh, definitely not uh, at a theme park. Um, uh, like, I think that a key phrase that you used there was, was dangerous or danger. Um, when you're at a theme park, when you're at a Disney theme park, uh, which occasionally will promise some kind of adventure for you, usually when you're getting on like a, like a mountain coaster, uh, one of the many mountain coasters that there are, that they, they are offering you some sort of adventure. 
Um, it's not really so much of an adventure, though. It's, there's no danger or uh, surprise involved. You know exactly the track. You're on a track, and it's an incredibly safe track. Um, and remarkably safe, remarkably Just safe, tested all the time. Very, very safe. There are accidents once in a while. Sure. Um, um but they, but, they are so few and far between. Yeah. And, and so this adventure that they promise, whether it's a, a Matterhorn mountain or an Everest mountain or a space mountain or a big thunder mountain or any other sort of mountains that exist, um, there is no, um, there, 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 there is very little actual adventure uh, that is given to the guest as they are, uh, as they're there. And, and other theme parks um, promise adventure more directly, uh, like a Six Flags or um, Islands of Adventure, for example. At Universal, but literally, Universal Orlando, yeah. Universal Orlando has a place literally called Islands of Adventure, but nowhere on one. It's it's not really an island, is it? Um, but it's also um, there. There's nothing. Truly, I mean, I mean, unless you are thrown so far out of your comfort zone simply by being at a theme park, there really is nothing adventurous about it. Yeah, and, and as we kind of get into these terms a little bit more, it may seem like we're kind of... Um... We're, we're kind of talking down about theme parks like theme parks aren't real adventures but that's I, I gotta I gotta emphasize this is the podcast that treats theme parks rides and attractions like literature like we love <laughs> theme parks um, but this may be a bit controversial Alice but if you want a real adventure a theme park isn't really the place to go for said adventure uh, it is among the safer uh, more um, more controlled sorts of trips you can take where the expectations are very clear and the peril is very low. Um, there are thrills to be had for sure, but they are hardly um, what I would call adventurous. Uh, even, even small adventurous things like eating an unexpected food um those don't really occur at theme parks because theme parks tend to make safer food choices that many people will like. Um, and going to places that uh, perhaps might not even be intended for entertainment could be considered a bit of an adventure, like trying to find your entertainment out there. But this is, you know, it's a controlled environment. Uh, it is the opposite of adventurous. Right, and so what, why we bring this up in this episode of the podcast, we're going to to take these these three words and talk about like like why the theme parks use them and um, and in in what context that they are used and, and 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 really dissect these three words. Why do you think, buddy, that that adventure is a word that that a lot of theme parks cling to, even when when a theme park experience can and should be a fairly predictable, like, measured experience for a person or a family. Uh, why Why do you think a theme park uh, would choose the word adventure? I, Alice, I, I gotta say something before I, before I dive into my theories. Okay. Um, I just realized that California Adventure has the word <laughs> adventure. <in it. laughs> oh, God. Just now. We've been talking so about this, this idea for an episode for maybe a month, and... <laughs> And no, you're absolutely right. It did not. Oh my it gosh. actually, we skipped right over California Adventure and went to Islands of Adventure instead. Okay. That's... <laughs> oh no. <laughs> I'm embarrassed for us, honestly. Uh, but I leave it in. We were, I thought that we were getting good at this theme park thing, but it turns out that we forgot about maybe the second most important theme park to us personally. Yep, and it's right down the street. It's literally and right there. <laughs> there it is, California Adventure. What about okay, let's let's <laughs> let's let's come back to it. Okay. So what about California Adventure? What about Islands of Adventure? What about any of these any other park even that doesn't include the name adventure in the in the name but uh wants but wants to invoke that in why why would a theme park want to in, invoke that in a in a visitor i've got i've got a couple of theories um so when 
we talk about the word adventure, sometimes we fall into treating it as a genre. Um, and I think that's really clear in, for example, Adventureland, um, where adventure stands in for a genre that includes um, things like journeying to uncharted destinations, uh, things like encountering danger. Um, and if you want to know a little bit more about other things in the adventure genre, uh, please do check out our episode on the Jungle Cruise and colonialism. Uh, we promise it's worth an excellent listen. Um, but, you know, that's that's like one aspect. I think that's kind of where the origin of the word adventure in theme parks is. Uh, this idea that a theme park could provide a simulation of that genre of film or literature, right? And it, it can put you right in the middle of it. So I think like that's one. So put a pin in that. I think the other reason we might call our trip to a theme park an adventure or why we might put adventure in front of our theme park's name um, is because we want the audience to feel like, I mean, this is my guess, we want them to feel like it is an adventure. There's a lot about theme park rides and attractions that is dedicated to making you feel like you're in danger. Um, making you feel like something has gone wrong. For example, the something that has gone wrong trope, right? Yes, um, Universal is is an expert at that kind of ride. Right, and, and so it's not just a trip to the set of The Mummy, or it's not just a trip to Jurassic Park, um, soon to be Jurassic World, but it's like an adventurous sort of striking out into what happens when those places go wrong. Um, and, and in the case of California adventure, actually, I think that's kind of a unique use of the word. We want the audience to feel like they're exploring new territory because this theme park has just opened up next to maybe the world's most famous theme park. And this is a, a kind of an adventurous, like different take on a theme park. So that's kind of like a, a a different use of the word. Like, come on in and experience this new novelty, this adventure uh, that we're taking you on. Right. Even though, even though that like day one California adventure and even still to this day relies a lot on like like a trope of a classic theme park, like a like a pier. Um, or, or you know, classic uh, spins on classic attractions, Ferris wheels, and 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 whatnot. They still want to draw. The, the, you, so you think that that the word adventure is is meant as like a, a like to draw people in? Yeah, it's it's almost of? it's self referential. It's like this is going to be a big adventure. The theme park itself is an adventure, um, and you know, it, it would be rather boring to say come to our theme park where everything is exactly as you expect it and nothing bad happens. Come to our theme park, the safe choice for a family vacation. Like, <laughs> I'm sorry, that's actually what Disneyland is selling in many ways, um, as well as Walt Disney World. That's However, what, you can't yes. put that on a brochure. You cannot, but I do <laughs> think that Disneyland and the Magic Kingdom uh, do rely on on that and, and they don't say it outright but i think that advertising um advertising a simple disneyland park or magic kingdom or even disneyland paris for example uh as this is disneyland it is family friendly it is safe it is fun everyone's going to come here and have a good time there is no danger it's just your friends mickey and also his friends um <laughs> Your They're... friend Mickey and all of his friends who were not invited. And actually, <laughs> this is getting a little obnoxious. There's just so many friends here. Why and all every... these friends here? <laughs> and everyone is friends and everyone is happy and we're all having a really good time. And I think I I want to transition a little to connect those ideas. That I, that I, I think that where a California adventure or a Six Flags or a Universal will rely on the idea of adventure, I think... Uh, the the quote unquote safer parks that aren't promising adventure um, are maybe promising the, our, our second word of the day, which is exploration. Exploration um, is I, I kept almost saying it when I was talking about adventure because it's so closely connected, but it, it is, is a different flavor. It's closely connection connected. It's a different flavor, and um, 
uh, I think that we want to let let our friend Lena Jean talk here for a moment about uh, about visiting this park that was. A, a new park that felt like home and what it felt like to explore this new space. Hi, buddy. Hi, Alice. Longtime listener, first time caller. Recently, I was on vacation in Europe and I had the opportunity to take a trip to see Disneyland Paris. And I was so excited that you guys wanted me to call in about my experiences. So I'm a cast member in Florida and I frequented Disneyland growing up. So I have really deep emotional and professional ties to Disney and to the American theme parks. So this was really, really exciting. So we started at Walt Disney Studios, which is the smaller of the two parks there. Right away, I was really charmed. The park is themed into separate studio lots, which represent aspects of film production, and it's decorated like 1930s Hollywood. It's really similar to Hollywood Studios in Florida, uh, which is their sister park, or even a little bit to California Adventure. I will say that before doing research after I got home, it was really easy to see the park as just one big conglomeration of things that looked like they somewhat had to do with movies in some way, shape, or form. I didn't really see any differentiation between the lands or lots in the park at first, and everything looked pretty haphazardly cobbled together. We ended up finishing in about a quarter day, which is surprising, but it was the off-season and a lot of the attractions were under refurbishment. We did get to do a few rides, Rock and Roller Coaster, Tower of Terror, but the winner in my heart absolutely was the Ratatouille ride. I was blown away by how cool it was. Just, wow, I wish I had more words. It was probably my favorite dark ride ever. It was such a smart use of 3D and trackless technology. I felt immersed. It was cute. It was precious. It made the whole park worth visiting, and I can't wait to get it in America. And then we went over to Disneyland Park. It was set up pretty similarly to the parks in America and featured Adventureland, Frontierland, Fantasyland, and Discoveryland. Walking into the park, I immediately felt at home. Main Street is styled pretty similarly to the American parks as well, and at the very end of the street was Sleeping Beauty Castle. It was probably the prettiest of the castles I've seen, if I'm being honest, and the fact that it was snowing while we were in Disneyland was just the cherry on top. She was beautiful. Now, many of the same token attractions have a home in Disneyland that we have in America. So Big Thunder Mountain, Pirates, Hyperspace Mountain. We got to go on all the big rides except for Phantom Manor, which was closed. But honestly, it felt like all the big money went into these because they were built when the park was. And it shows with how cool they all were. Big Thunder was longer and faster. Pirates has a clearer storyline and more interesting build. And Space Mountain was just so good. It had loops. It was fast. It was awesome. Now, Adventureland was also really smartly designed to have a huge play area with caves and bridges and a pirate ship. And if it hadn't been snowing and closed, I would have absolutely explored all of it. Uh, so the part that I think was uh, important here is the idea of a, a park that's a big conglomeration of things that's kind of haphazardly cobbled together. I, I think that this this is the part I wanted to highlight when we're talking about exploration, because when you have a, a park that seemingly has no, that seems to have no cohesion connecting one piece of it to another, uh, such as, uh, as a Universal Hollywood, um, the the lower part of the park, which has just a bunch of different rides and different IPs kind of smushed together with no uh, transition. Right. That That Between is them? something that's changing a little bit. But in earlier times, the lower lot of Universal Studios Hollywood was kind of notorious for being like three big beige buildings that and had with- like a little bit of facade work in one area of each of the f- the big beige buildings. Right. And you, so you get these three IPs that are competing for your attention um, where you would have like a, 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 a mummy character walking around who could walk directly in front of a like a velociraptor animatronic um, where the mummy and Jurassic Park and uh, now it's Transformers are all so close together and with no transition space between them um, to to where the yeah this this um this like haphazardly cobbled together space like Lena said 
Um, well, I think that that kind of haphazard conglomeration of things opens itself up to a lot of exploration because I, I have a distinct memory of going down to the lower lot of Universal Studios and walking around down there with the three rides that were down there that um, that we had ridden a thousand times and just wandering around a corner and finding a hidden museum, like film museum down there that no one else was in or visiting. And because the park had been thrown together so haphazardly, it opened up uh, like it, it, by putting a new ride in, the entrance to that museum was kind of blocked from view um, and because it, it, it seemed to have no thought put into how it was designed. It also opened it up to an exploration for us. But that kind of exploring the park when there's so many maps and so many um, like guides online and stuff like that. Can you really explore a space that is so that is so mapped out and so planned like a Disneyland? Like Alice, you and I were talking about this in preparation for this episode. And one thing that we kept coming back to is there are little places like you just described that museum on the lower lot of Universal Studios. Not sure if it's even there anymore, but uh, that that feel natural or maybe unnatural like unexpected um that feel like they maybe shouldn't be there that kind of feel like you discover them when you get to them and we think of exploration as being uh again uh unplanned uh someplace you've never been a place that um opens up as you think about it more as you experience more of it um and you can explore all sorts of things you can explore your neighborhood if you are just moving in someplace. You can explore um, a building if there are little nooks and crannies to look through. But the thing about theme parks and exploration is that, like, come in and explore Disneyland or just having a great day exploring Disneyland are words that I have heard people say or I have read. But Disneyland is not, in my opinion, here to be explored. Um, and that's, it's hard for me to say because I do understand that feeling, that feeling of like turning a corner and being like, what's over here, being excited about finding new things, but I'm not sure Disneyland is explored as much as it's experienced as intended, or maybe you have an unintended experience and that's what feels like exploration. But if you know what you're getting, it's not really exploring, is it? I guess, I guess not. But I wonder if that perspective comes from, from the point of view of, uh, uh, from your point of view as someone who has been to the park too many times. <laughs> like a lot of times. Yes, like I'm... more more than maybe was ever intended. Uh, which again, <laughs> unintended experience, right? Right. I just wonder if 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 a place can be so thoroughly mapped out and so thoroughly already explored, if, if the idea of exploring the theme park is left now to just those who have never visited before. And that ex exploration, I think, is like a really personal journey and something that I think that Disney has encouraged is new people explore the park as is returning visitors explore the park with new things in mind like uh hidden mickeys for example that's that actually a really great point i i agree that that adding that extra layer of things to look for adds to that feeling of exploration so that the first time visitor to universal studios goes down to the lower lot and rides jurassic world mummy and transformers and they got a they ex, they explored that space. They learned something about that space, and the museum, whether it's there or not, doesn't mean anything to them yet. But that the it's placed there for future visit for people who visit more than once, or for like really dedicated. I'm going to turn this corner to see what's behind this wall. People, like it's it's rewarding. 
dedication to the park. Yeah, I, I think you're kind of exp- exploring this, I- exploring. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're kind of connecting it to this idea of, of layered experiences where, where there are multiple ways to experience something. And there is the uh, stick your nose in the map, look where you're going, and then go there layer, uh, which can be very wonderful and explorative for somebody new. But then if you want to go one layer deeper and look for all the hidden uh, gems and, and trivia, and for example, the um, the windows on Main Street, which all have uh, Imagineers and other cast members' names on them. Right. Or, um, you know, other little places in Disneyland. Alice, you were talking about the Wishing Well, for example. Oh, yeah. So uh, we mentioned this in our, you know, our very, very, very first episode of this podcast, where you remembered walking back behind on the side of the castle at Disneyland back where there's this little wishing well um, tucked away back there, where I, I genuinely always forget that it's back there every time that I go until I stumble upon it. Um, like if I'm walking through the castle and I get tired of the crowds or I need to just duck out of a side door really fast, or I just, I, 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 I always find myself just coming across the, uh, the wishing well. And when I see it or I remember its existence, I, I'm, it brings a smile to my face. I'm like, Oh my gosh, the wishing well. I'm so glad that I, that I saw this today. What a magical little space, but I didn't. I did not necessarily explore to find it. It's not hidden. It's not it's not off the map. It's not even like a secret. It's just not immediately visible. So I both did and did not explore to to find it. It's uh, I think that exploration more than adventure is is a more real feeling than uh I think exploration is more of a real feeling than adventure. Um, but it still is fabricated. It is designed. Yeah. And, and I think environments at theme parks are, um, are very intentionally put together to encourage people to look and notice and see, which is part of what makes them so appealing. Um, and another example that we were kind of working with for this, uh, exploration thing was, uh, Diagon Alley at Universal Orlando, Yes. And this idea of Diagon Alley being very twisty and turny and even having an entire secret alley in it. Right. Nocturne Alley, which is you have to duck down a, a little hall, basically, to find this, to find Nocturne Alley, which in the Harry Potter canon is where all of the the like dark arts stuff is. And the first time that we went, you and I went... Um, I, I don't how long ago was that like four years ago it was a while ago we went a long time ago and i do not remember on our visit i do not remember nocturne alley being there now i don't know if it's just because they added it later or if we were if it was too crowded or too busy or we just missed it somehow but the last time i visited and was there with lena jean um i saw nocturne alley and went no way there's no way that's real and found myself walking down this completely pitch black alley and found another shop and another couple of spells to do and the shop sold only like dark arts and death eater branded stuff and it was this it was this very cool little nook and it popped me out at the other side of the alley. it was basically like i cut a corner from one end of diagon alley to the other by using nocturne alley and there weren't a ton of people in there and it was kind of spooky. And I wondered if that was something that I had quote unquote discovered um, or if I was just so unobservant the first time <laughs> that we were there. I, 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 I wasn't, I wasn't sure, but that idea that, Oh, I found this little, this little nook back here, or I, I was looking in one of the windows and I found a cool reference to the books was that, I guess I guess my a feeling of accomplishment or discovery or exploration was that legitimate is it fabricated doesn't matter I guess is what I'm asking Alice that's a really interesting question and um 
in order to answer it, I think I might need to ask you something. Well, I, I, I don't think I can ask it out here. Oh, okay. Um, did you want to s- step into your office? Yeah, I mean, I've got... There's just a small presentation in here that I'd like to I'd like to offer to you. If you would just uh, follow me, please. Okay, sure. And uh, if you if you wouldn't mind uh, closing the door. Okay. Uh, so if you'll just turn your attention to the center of the room, uh, you'll see the diorama of my hypothetical theme park that I'm building. Oh wow, it's beautiful. Uh, thank you so much. I've I've paid many people and not paid many others. Uh, so <laughs> if you'll if you'll just take a look at the center here, I've designed what I call a uh, Duquesne's Mad Labyrinth. Uh, wow. And it's uh, what it is is it's several hundred uh, square yards that I've uh, turned into a sort of shopping tr- slash attraction center. Um, and many of the nooks and crannies here will be unreachable by just about the entire uh, visiting populace uh, unless they <laughs> engage a series of locks and um, answer a couple of riddles and then also uh, they have to form a human bridge. There are several challenges along the way, not to mention uh, some armed guards to make sure you know that they're combat ready and stuff like that. And then um, <laughs> it, it, once they get to the center, there's a couple of secret shops and stuff and they're just really, really like in-depth uh, stuff from the, those happy places lore um and you can finally buy the the omni mover t-shirt right in here as well ah uh, yes the um, omni mover t-shirt we've been promising right. from episode one <laughs> um and so alice i i just what do you think of this as a as a concept for a theme park uh where we make things kind of intentionally obtuse but then everything that you see is really really like unique and earned and uh interesting and and feels very valid you know, I see its merit as uh, for maybe some diehard um, theme park fans, and um, I I don't I do not see its commercial appeal. I don't think that you could open this and uh, expect any kind of financial success. I think um, I I think by making things too difficult, uh, you have alienated a big chunk of your of your audience. <laughs> Well, that's good, Alice, because this is not real. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, good. (laughs) If, in fact, you weren't even in my office. What? And guess what? What? We're on a podcast. (laughs) Oh, that's that's wild. That's... (laughs) You've really, you've really done it this time, Duquesne. I have. Um, so, so what I was trying to get at with that dumb example, and I probably didn't get there at all, was: <laughs> is it, is it a good idea to have nooks and crannies in a theme park? Like, is it a good idea to have things that are explorable? I mean, when you had that moment in Nocturne, it was truly like it felt magical, right? Yes. And and we'll get to magic in a moment, but it felt very special. It felt unique to you. And that's great. However, it can't make very good business sense. It can't make very good use of space sense, people flow sense um, to hide things in a theme park. Um, and, And sometimes it feels like, especially with the Disney parks, the things that are little nooks and crannies, the things that feel like, oasis or um, little spots that only you know about are not necessarily there on purpose, but they're there kind of because that's how it was at one point and something kind of got built around it. And now it's kind of a leftover or they're there because it was intended for a much smaller amount of people to be in the park. So they kind of left some of these, you know, smaller nooks and crannies because those were really useful back then for what the design was. And, now they're a little less useful, so it, the thoroughfare just kind of goes past it and stuff like that. Those little areas are probably not intentional. And I think if a, a theme park designer is is thinking about these things, they're probably not saying to themselves, aha, but I've got to include like a little secret passage. I've got to include a shop that almost nobody will get to. Uh, and it sometimes makes me wonder like how lucky we are to have those little things, but also... Will we see them in a lot of future developments and a lot of future theme parks? I think we, I think we will. And I, and I think this because 
of the uh, of the boom of uh, of Disney vlogs, of Disney blogs, of uh, entire websites, and even unauthorized books dedicated to finding the nooks and crannies or unlocking the secrets of like and, and finding hacks like Disney hacks and stuff like that. I think that. Um, that so long as people are interested in finding little secrets and nooks and hidden Mickeys and whatnot, I think that they will continue to make them. Uh, here's another uh, another example: um, the the infamous purple wall at at, at Disney World oh, at yeah. the Magic Kingdom at Disney World. So grammable. The- so the purple wall, so grammable. It is my my uh, Discord profile picture of me with the purple wall. Um, I knew that the purple wall was a thing, but I would not have found it. It is uh, it is like kind of tucked away in this weird part of Tomorrowland that's just a walkway from one thing to another. Uh, I wouldn't have found it if I hadn't ducked into that walkway to get out of the rain. And uh. suddenly I was standing there, and I went, oh. This must be the purple wall everybody was talking about. And there was a photographer, a Disney PhotoPass photographer standing there saying, yeah, I'll take a picture of you in the wall if you want to. <laughs> it's like meeting a celebrity. A wall And I was like, it was a, a, it's a wall. wall celebrity. I, was, though I, think I like wall celebrity <laughs> okay, better. Well. I, I met this wall celebrity um, and I was, I was just, it was just me and my mom. And a few other, a handful of other people, mostly, mostly girls about my age, um, we're the only ones to kind of like walk through there and they walked through there like deliberately like these girls were like i am finding that wall and they found it and they took took a picture with the purple wall they took several pictures with the wall and but very few people use that walkway as just a walkway um and it was honestly just the purple wall and so yeah it i think was rewarding people especially instagrammers and bloggers and stuff for for just taking a pathway that no one else would um, yeah. and I think, and I think they're, because the parks are so popular, I think there is incentive for more of those designs to hide a, a wall of a cool color or a, um, an, uh, an interactive, uh, animatronic or something in, in a spot that not a lot of people would go. And I think there, I think there's incentive for that. Yeah, I think and there's a market for it. I, I don't necessarily disagree, and I think a lot of what makes theme parks so special is that feeling of personal experience. And I feel like one of the only ways to do it with a popular theme park is to create those spaces to make people feel like they got something special that was unique to them, at least right then, at least at least in that moment. Um, yeah. Instead of making people feel like they are all walking the same path. I'm kind of reminded of Ikea, actually. Uh, Okay. Um, All right. I I, I know. Tell me more. (laughs) Ikea is a vaguely themed space. It's very Swedish. Um, And there's lots of big signs and interesting lighting. And I kind of like going to Ikea. It kind of feels like going to Disneyland because of how constructed it is. Um, However, uh, people sometimes talk about getting lost in Ikea um or like spending hours in ikea like i can't find my way out of ikea (laughs) Uh, and maybe it's just hyperbole because it is a big store but like i can do ikea in like 15 minutes guys and even if i want to browse like that's on purpose and there's like one path like i don't understand this idea that you can be lost in ikea there's a very designed singular path and sometimes i feel like especially at Disneyland, that there's kind of one path that I end up taking, that it kind of encourages me. Actually, we were talking about this on the Discord. We either go clockwise or counterclockwise at Disneyland. Um, Right. We we go along the spokes of the wheel, um, and I have many times started both clockwise and counterclockwise, and both have their advantages, but it it sometimes feels like, oh, geez, I'm just kind of going from one thing to to the next. I'm just kind of on a path. I'm not really taking an atmosphere. I'm not really exploring. I'm just walking the path that was determined to me. And Disneyland becomes special when I'm not doing that. When, when I take a break, when I duck into a side alley, when I'm in New Orleans Square and I'm in that one shop, you know, that one shop, 
Um, yeah. And and we like, all know that one shot. Yeah, and <laughs> and it's like, like this is special. This is Disneyland. This is personal. This feels like it's mine. But when you're out on the big thoroughfares, I'm like, ooh, I don't know. Like, is this special? Is this for me? And I think once again, though, that comes from a perspective of someone who's been there a lot of times. <laughs> uh, fair enough. I, yeah, that I I I think that someone who has never been to Disneyland before has the 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 who who has never been and has wanted to go and has dreamed about going can get that same feeling of this is this is awesome this is mine this is this is special i think they can get that from from the main thoroughfare just from the first sight of the castle or um hearing the hearing the music play on main street or or seeing space mountain from afar where they're like this this is my experience this is my view and my vision as uh, and it's real and it's happening in front of me um i think is uh is really important to remember i think it's important to remember as people and 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 most of our listeners too i think are people who are are theme park junkies and who go a lot i think it's important to remember that the tourists that might be in your way or who are taking up a lot of space on the main thoroughfares they might not be experiencing it the same way as you are and not appreciating the little details the same way as you are but they are still experiencing something that's really truly magical to them alice i totally agree and i think that means that we're ready to move on to our third word which is what's our third word buddy? magic <laughs> oh the word i just said right it's a perfect segue <laughs> and i just didn't nail it so uh i think i think it's best if we <laughs> let lena take over here because she had something really interesting to say about the level and quality of magic at disneyland paris so those were the parks when i walked in i expected home and what i got was pretty close. Disneyland Paris was absolutely magical and beautiful, but it had hardly any of the things that really make Disney magical and beautiful to me. While these big token attractions were great, and we got to go on the rides we know and love from back home with short wait times and see how they compared, the magic felt really strange. It was kind of empty. And I've taken some time to really try to understand why this was, and honestly, I think it was just a combination of a lot of different things. First, it was the off-season. It was snowing. The parks were empty. They were going to be slow. And if I'm being honest, it was really nice to have short wait times for everything. Second, it's France. Culturally, it's completely different than America. And this came through with everything. When talking to the cast members or seeing other people in the park, it didn't feel the same as the Disney parks in America because it's a completely different place. And finally, Disneyland Paris really needs some financial love. And luckily, they're going to get it really soon. The park has struggled financially since it opened and is about to undergo a lot of renovation and refurbishment. It was going through a lot while we were there and clearly needed it in a lot of other places, even with how cool everything was at first glance. Now, ultimately, I wouldn't say I was disappointed with my whole experience, but I definitely didn't get the pure, unadulterated magic that I was expecting from a Disney park. We saw the castle, we rode the rides, we ate some expensive food, we bought some souvenirs but none of it was as convincing as I would have hoped it would be. The cast were disappointingly stoic and uninterested too much of the time. The people weren't nearly as enthusiastic or kind, even when meeting the characters or going on the rides. And there was so much under refurbishment and I didn't get to see the dragon under the castle, which I'm still really upset about, but you know. This is where we get to my dilemma as both an American who grew up surrounded by Disney nostalgia and an American-based Disney cast member. Historically, the Parisians' attitude towards Disneyland was never an entirely enthusiastic one, as it was inherently an American thing and a distinctly not American place. Despite the parts of these parks that are extremely well done, the rest of it feels uncared for uh, and unimportant. With paint chipping and just dirty, the cast didn't really seem to care about making magic or staying in good show or even having pride in their park or in their work, which came off as surprising and jarring to someone who does that all the time at home. 
Now, was I holding Disneyland Paris to standards that were just too high? Should we expect the best possible from Disney, even if the place and the people that are supposed to be upholding those standards don't culturally agree with them? Was what I saw abnormal, just to be expected? Now, visiting Disneyland Paris was a great experience, but it was also a wake-up call that Disney nostalgia in America has probably spoiled me. Now, I'm really excited that so much is going to go into Disneyland Paris to make it better, but honestly, I couldn't say for sure whether I'll go back anytime soon. Now, seeing the castle in the snow, though, was probably the best experience I could have asked for anyway. So, what I heard from Lena was kind of two things. Thing number one was that she felt the magic, that Disneyland Paris was special and magical and a great time. And thing number two was the magic had a different flavor uh sort of a uh i don't know like like kind of a, a strange unfamiliarity because of the change in culture between america and france um and that's really interesting especially as lena is a magic maker herself and that's I, alice you you and i might find that a bit cliche and maybe maybe other cast members uh who are hearing this might feel it as well but when you work at Disneyland, there are these concepts, uh, show and magic that are um, from the first moment uh, kind of instilled into you, right? Right. They they in, they put in the heads of all cast members when you're going through traditions, when you're going through training, when you are, are being put out in front of guests. Yeah, there are certain words and certain phrases that get used a lot. And it, for one, it's guests, not customers, not visitors. They are guests. Um, you are not wearing a uniform. You are wearing a costume. When you are in front of people, you are on stage. When you are in the in the break room, you are off stage. There are there are but most importantly, when you are making, when you are dealing with a guest, you are helping them experience the magic. You are, uh, you are the, the person that is there to make sure that that person's magical experience never has a down moment. That that person never feels like they have stepped off the Disney lot they have, they don't feel like they're dealing with regular um, retail people that they are not having. A, the, you are there to make sure that they have a magical day. Right. And it's actually, in my opinion, an incredibly effective mindset because it works. Disneyland and other Disney parks feel different than other places. Even having been there and worked there and known how big of an effort it is to keep that alive when you're out of it for a little while and you go and visit, or maybe even while you're still in it and you go visit as a guest, there's this feeling of everybody here is going to try their best for me. And if I have a problem and I ask for a solution, people are going to try and I might get that solution or I might get something that I didn't expect in the first place. Um, I was there with Kate Prince a couple of years back and she she got an injury at Disneyland. Um, she bumped her, her leg a little bit and we went and saw the nurse and they patched her up and she got a coupon for a free churro to make her day feel better. It was a really oh. adorable, sweet moment. We're not talking about like the big things all the time. We're talking about the little things, too. And the Disney parks are really good at putting forth this idea of magic. And not only that, it, it's used internally, sure, but it's also used externally. It's magical vacations by Disney, right? It's right. this idea that these places transcend the real. They give you more than you could ever expect. They are bigger than they are. They're magic. And Alice, you and I... We believe in magic, um, but that said, it's not a real thing. It's it's not. I mean, magic in in the wave your wand and make something from nothing sense of the word is not real. Just like uh, like adventure and exploration are manufactured concepts. Uh, magic also is that. It's, it's not <laughs> magic is also 
magic is also fabricated. Just like you, you're not really having a true adventure. You're not really exploring anything new or uncharted. You are not actually experiencing magic. Yeah. But However. Does that, <laughs> but does that take away how you feel? Does that take away from how you feel when you see the fireworks show over the castle? Does that does does that take away from your feeling like there is like there is magic? Like does it matter if magic is real or not? I guess I guess probably not. Uh, but that's kind of what we're we're here in this segment to talk about. Like, magic is not real. Magic is a word that is used to describe theme parks quite often. Not just Disney parks, but especially Disney parks. Mm-hmm. Um, and yet, magic is. If we if we break magic into its like truest definition, then magic is a confluence of remarkably complex systems and very dedicated people that put a lot of time and effort and knowledge and money and expertise and artistic skill into creating things that cause wonder or happiness and i actually feel like i might get choked up talking about this it's actually kind of beautiful that's magic like that really (laughs) is magic like that anything could ever be so organized that it could ever really be put that well together that any group of people could provide that that i mean like working at disneyland working at a disney park is not easy it's not an easy job um However, there are those little moments, Alice, you and I could easily tell them. I know Lena has told us a few. Um, These stories of when you make somebody's day and it does feel like you've done something bigger than yourself. Yeah, that you've that you've changed something or touched someone or that you've that you've contributed to. To the magic. That you're not just making magic, but you're contributing to the aura of magic around the place. It's um, it's intoxicating, really. It was my favorite part of working there, was being able to have someone say, oh my god, you just made my day, or... Uh, you know, getting a, I used to get hugs from little kids every once in a while, <laughs> which was the best. Um, where, where you know that even if they don't remember you specifically that you you remember what that they remember what how you made them feel and that you contributed to them having a good time and i have never had that same experience um at any job since <laughs> um i know in my job now i i focus a lot i i try really hard to make sure everybody's having a nice i think that's just part of who I am. I want to make sure everybody's having a good time, that everyone's comfortable and happy. Um, But I don't feel indebted to the company I work for. um, Or I don't feel like I need to make sure that, that I don't, I don't, I don't feel like I did at Disney where as a representative of Disney, I wanted to make sure they were having a nice time so that Disney's reputation of being a magical place was maintained for every single guest. I don't feel that in my current job and I've never felt that since. Yeah. And, and it's, you're right. It, when that job at uh, the Disneyland resort was at its hardest, the thing that made it worthwhile was when you were able to make some magic and that was that was the verbiage we used as well. Like mm-hmm. today, I made some magic for so and so, and I did this for them, right? Um, and like, I think what Lena's voicemail gets to is how tenuous that that magical feeling is, and how everything can be in place. We can have the rides, and we can have the attractions, and we can have the food. And we can have all of the beautiful detailed artwork and we can have the theming. We can have everything we need, but just a couple of cold shoulders, uh, a couple of people just kind of doing their job and not really making it fun, not really making it magical. Those things don't destroy the magic, but they definitely give it a different flavor. And I think that was a feeling that Lena 
described really interestingly and that I haven't felt not having been to a not American Disney park ever, um, but that I'm interested in experiencing when I do eventually. Yeah, I wonder if it... I wonder if it would be different in and in not the off season. I wonder if if it was just a just a, a, a weird day. It was snowing and everything like which sounds amazing and magical. It does sound the very snow. beautiful. But I wonder if that brings the mood down of the people who have to work there or 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 something. I mean, you you never know. But yeah, I'd like to I'd like to experience that flavor of magic for myself in person, but I'm so grateful that Lena decided to share that with us. Um, I, I, it brought, it got me thinking about, um, about something when I visited Disney world for the first time, talking to a cast member who was super nice and, and friendly and, and everything and, and was willing to chat very, very classic uh, cast member experience in America um, to to talk to her and I said wow it's wild being here in the Magic Kingdom when Disneyland is my home and I've never and I, it's just it's so similar but so different and she said well it's kind of like if somebody went into your house and moved all of your furniture three feet to the right and didn't tell you and the idea of ex- of going to a place that feels so familiar but is so different that it f- still feels like home but everything's just just different enough to be off-putting is kind of what I, I think maybe was happening um, to to Lena in in Paris um, where yeah it does still have the f- the flavor of home it still feels like Disney but it's just different enough where you are thrown off and yeah the flavor of the magic chain to somebody who only ever goes to paris and that is their disney their home disney park they might never that the, they might listen to those voicemail and go oh i would i never experience anything like that it's always magical and it's always amazing um because just because everyone experiences magic a little different i think i Agree. And this concept of feeling home, especially at the Disney parks, is something that I hear a lot, even from people who don't visit very often. Like, it's kind of like that moment from uh, Star Wars The Force Awakens. Like, they walk through the gates of Disneyland, they look around, they're like, I'm home, right? Yep. Chewie, we're home. We're home. Um, And everybody's going to be saying that as they board the Millennium Falcon at Star Wars Galaxy's Edge which is going to be amazing. And I actually can't wait to do it myself. I don't care how I'm cliche gonna cry. it is. I'm going to cry. I'm going to say it. Yeah, I'm going to say it. <laughs> um, <laughs> but this idea of feeling home in a public place, in a place that is a, a, a very much a business, um, and of, of feeling like it's a special place that in some way belongs to you, uh, that's also very special. I think that's like another side of the magic And I do wonder if not feeling home in a place does have to do with that lack of magic. I mean, Alice, when you were at Walt Disney World, did it feel magical the way Disneyland does? Absolutely. Did it did it feel strange? Absolutely. So it was like (laughs) a like a slight change in your magic, right? Uh, Yes. and, And I wonder... I wonder how common that is, um, especially since we we sort of have, as you have said many times in this episode, we sort of had a uh, all the time sort of a going to Disneyland sort of thing. I just said sort of a lot. Um, <laughs> we had a thing where we were at Disneyland all the time. Not just when we worked there, but when we were growing up, we were just we always had passes. We were always there. We were always at Disney. Yeah. Um, and... Yeah, I, I wonder, but but even even so, and this is where I think magic might be of our of our three words of the day. Why magic might be the the strongest one. Um, whereas over time, visiting a theme park, even even ones uh, even non Disney theme parks, because we've held passes to Universal Studios and Knott's Berry Farm and Six Flags all, um, it's to visit a theme park over and over again. You lose 
some of the exploration and you you might lose some of the adventure um but you don't necessarily lose the m magic of being there i think it's our it's the strongest word and the strongest feeling that a theme park can evoke um is the idea of what you're doing right now where you are right now it might not be the biggest adventure of your life and and you might not have seen anything new or out of the ordinary today but the fact that you're here is magical alice that sounds like a perfect way to wrap up our conversation on exploration adventure and magic at theme parks but you know the conversation does continue online the conversation is always happening online. We are on the internet everywhere, but most especially on Twitter. You can follow us at Happy Places Pod on, on Twitter. And we are always sharing cool articles we've read and cool pictures of the parks. And oftentimes we share links to our Discord server. Yeah, and our Discord server is a great place full of amazing people uh, who are always having great conversations about theme parks, rides, attractions. Uh, roadside attractions, uh, theme park food. Oh, and we have a general muckery section as well, where we talk about all sorts of things uh, not <laughs> theme park related. Yeah, and so the, the Discord's a great a place to be and an awesome place to have a conversation with us and with fellow uh, listeners and fans of those happy places. If you uh, want to help us keep things like that going and uh, eventually to uh, make and design that Omnimover t-shirt we've been promising for a, a, over a year I'll now. All praise the Omnimover. All praise the Omnimover. The best place to do that would be on our Patreon. I mentioned at the beginning of the episode is patreon.com slash those happy places. There are uh, 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 several tiers for all budgets and every single tier does, in, does include uh, access to uh, monthly bonus episodes. We'll be putting out short little uh, five to ten minute episodes on various other conversations that just aren't long enough to have a full episode about. Uh, also might include sometimes the bonus episode might be a behind the scenes talk or some bloopers. You'll never know what you're going to get. And that is available at every tier from $2 to $4, to $7 to $15. Um, you can, at, at any budget, you can help us make this show. And we thank those who are our patrons, but we also thank those who are just not, maybe not in the, in the place right now for that. And we, but if you listen, we love you and appreciate you no matter what. And of course we'd always love to hear from you. Um, yes. And now speaking of people, we appreciate Alice. Did you know that right now our listeners are hearing our theme music, our theme music, which is golden gate by the California feet warmers featuring Phil Alvin. Yes. You can find this and other tracks at www.californiafeetwarmers.com. Now I'm going to add some extra music, some extra music. Did, was the extra music maybe composed by Kevin McLeod? Yeah. And Kevin McLeod put a bunch of his music up on his free music archive. You can find that all at incompetech.com. These are all available using the Com Creative Commons License 3.0. Thank you, Kevin, for being such an amazing creative person that helps out other creative people. Yes, thank you, Kevin. Thank you to the Feet Warmers. Thank you to Lena Jean, most especially for contributing that awesome voicemail and giving us so much to think and talk about and for being so active on the Discord and on our Twitters and for being an awesome, awesome, awesome person and cast member. You're great. Yes, thank you, Lena, so much for that excellent voicemail. It really did get us thinking about these three words especially. So I hope that the conversation that it inspired was something you enjoyed too. And Alice, thank you for being such an amazing co-host. Uh, and buddy, thank you for being a great co-host and my best friend. Oh, Alice, come on. Uh, You're going to make me blush. <laughs> I'm blushing. Oh, no. No. Oh, it started. <laughs> uh, and to everybody out there, thank you for listening. And we hope you return to those happy places. 